So welcome everybody to our um, PAFSO breakfast with uh, uh, our general manager, uh, Bert Meir and uh, Paul and Monique, members of his, uh, his labor relations team. Um, before we start, I would just like to acknowledge that um, I am chairing this meeting from the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people, and I acknowledge and respect them as the past, present, and future guardians and caretakers of these lands. And uh, since I see that people are coming from, joining from different places, I invite you to take a moment to think about uh, the traditional peoples of uh, the places you're joining from and, and what that means for, for us here in Canada. Um, without further ado, I would just like to thank uh, uh, Bertrand and uh, Paul and Monique for joining us. I will turn over the floor to to Bertrand. Um, the uh, vous pouvez poser des questions dans la langue de votre choix, uh, l'équipe est bilingue. <laughs> Et, uh, um, but I'm not sure, Bert, if you're going to do most of your presentation in English or if you if you have have decided. I will alternate, Pat. I will alternate between uh, English and French. So. Okay, yeah. so um, you can put you can uh, put your questions in the Q and A. I will keep an eye on the discussion. Uh, there'll be a period for questions at the end, but if you have something that is hot pursuit, I might um, jump in and draw Bert's attention to it. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn over the uh, the controls to him. I'm going to put my own um, screen on. Uh, hide my own video so that I'm not, you don't see my weird little face staring there at you. And uh, we'll let you go ahead. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Pam. Uh, it's kind of bizarre to, to to hear that you're calling me Bertrand because uh, that that rarely happens. <laughs> Laugh. Uh, <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. As Pam mentioned, my real name is Bertrand Mir. I'm also known as Bert. I'm the general manager. And uh, technically speaking, uh, my role uh, when it comes to uh, representation services is to essentially, obviously, I manage uh, the labor relation advisory team, uh, but I'm also responsible, I guess, for coordinating uh, the, the service that we provide our members. So essentially, this is, this is my role within the organization. Now, before I continue on, may I ask, how do I go about in, in putting the document that I want to put on screen that everybody can can see? Uh, sorry, I'm not a I'm not a technically inclined person. Sorry. So in the bottom of your screen, you yes. should have a, a green share screen button. Oh, there you go. OK. OK. Yeah. Perfect. Um, now I have to locate that. actual presentation, right? Ooh. Yes, so open up your document. Okay, there you go. Yep. Can every can can you all see the document? Um I can I can just see your um your your menu of files. So I suggest um to go out of shared screen yeah. and then go go back to your document and open it up. And then go, then go back. Um, here, I can put, I'll put mine okay. back on. That'll stop yours. Okay. Um, and then go, go open up your presentation. Yeah, and, right. Okay. Now make sure that you've got CUC mine is highlighted. Like with the, you see the red on my, on my first slide. Make sure your cursor at the beginning of your of your document and then um wow when you open it up it should it should it should go on there i don't know sorry about that folks now you can okay if i put that can you see it now no no still in your in your file menu do you want to send me your presentation yeah, that's can, what i'll uh, do pam because okay, i think that's I'll, gonna be i'll write easy. it for you okay okay just bear with me folks for a second i'm sorry i apologize for this um do you want to um maybe we could just talk about um yes. about 
why we thought we we um this was a good idea to do this this session. Yes. Um, we, and I'm doing I'm doing this as I'm sending you Pam the the presentation. Sorry for this, okay. folks. No uh, look, this presentation came about for two reasons. Uh, the first one, it fell under a request from uh, from some XCOM members who essentially, um, you know, wanted to wanted to better understand the role of our labor relation team. Uh, and second, and I, I guess the more important reason is that recently uh, we conducted a survey to our members uh, to try and find out if any of you were experiencing either discrimination or harassment in the workplace as a result of the current uh, conflict in the Middle East. And the result that we got from members, at least, who responded to the survey was a little bit interesting in the sense that uh, we clearly got some information that some of you were experiencing some discrimination or harassment in the workplace, but felt uh, a little bit uh, intimidated or did not really feel comfortable in approaching PAFSO with your issue because ultimately uh, the feeling was that, uh, you know, there was nothing that PAFSO could do uh, in order to help your cause. So this kind of triggered our reflection, both Pam and I, and, and we kind of agreed that maybe, uh, you know, this type of information in terms of the service that we provide was a little bit necessary to help every, everybody un better understand, you know, the role that the labor relation advisor team plays and, and also kind of explain some, some limitations around some of our, you know, some of our actions here. Obviously, the goal this morning is not to provide you with a full-blown training on how to become a, a labor relation expert, um, mostly for, for many reasons. I mean, the, the ultimate goal is to kind of present here the role that, that the, the LRA team plays uh, whenever they get uh, an issue or a concern that is raised by our members um, and and also kind of explain, like I said, some of our some of our limitations depending on the nature of the case. Um, you know from from our perspective, obviously, PAPSO as an organization, unlike other bigger bargaining agent, uh, we don't ask our local representative to play an active role in, in representation for, for many reasons. Uh, so the representation is solely the responsibility of the labor relation team. Um, we certainly do not have the resources and the structure as, as other uh, bargaining agent, namely, for example, the Alliance or PIPs, to kind of ask our, our local rep to play a, a bigger role or play a role uh, in representation. So, um, and, and also we have to also consider that because of the dynamic of our, of our membership, I mean, our membership being spread out across the world, essentially, it's difficult to have our local rep involved in cases. And also because of the nature of your work being rotational, that also complicates uh, our ability to have local reps involved in representation. So, you know, essentially your union dues pays, you know, our, our, our current team and it's their responsibility to ensure that uh, you're duly represented. Um, now, obviously I'm not impartial in all this, but I tend to think that uh, we have the best, uh, LROs in the business. That's my opinion. Uh, so Pam, if you can move to the next slide. Thanks. For... We're gonna jump in on your, your points about why we don't get um, XCOM members and local reps involved. From my point of view, there's a couple, there's a couple more <laughs> reasons yep. that I do not get involved generally in individual cases. And one of them is um, privacy. 
you know, we're we're colleagues and, you know, we could be working together in, in um, you know, because we're all rotational in a situation. I'm still, you know, officially I'm on leave without pay, but I'm a serving foreign service officer. I could be somebody's deputy director if I go back to GAC. You know, it puts people in an awkward position. And the other thing is, quite frankly, knowledge. You know, I can't count the number of times when um, I've I've said, well, that doesn't make sense or common sense would dictate, you know, blah, blah. And Bert and the team have uh, informed me that, you know, sometimes common sense is not a principle in labor relations or that, you know, I just don't uh, I don't have the knowledge and experience to know how a certain thing really plays out. So we want to avoid situations where people are getting wrong advice, frankly, um, you know, and where there could be liability associated with that. So um, from my point of view, that's why I, you know, want to stay out of it. And I think why most XCOM members are, are of the same, the same mind. Um, so I will go to your next slide. Uh, Thank you, Pam. Now, as I was saying, I, firmly believe we have the best LRA team in the business. And currently we have four labor relations advisors at PAFSO. Um, and, and these are, you know, identified by in the order that they were, that they were hired at PAFSO when they, when they joined PAFSO. So we have Marc Leclerc. Uh, Marc has joined PAFSO in January, 2015. These are expert subject matter on every every issue that pertains to pay. Um, so that includes obviously Phoenix issues. Uh, classification, for example, is also uh, part of his his area of expertise, and and also anything that has to do with with pay administration. Now, we also have Paul Raven. I am fortunate enough to have Paul joining us this morning. So I will let Paul introduce himself and provide you with uh, a little bit of his background in terms of uh, his role in representation. Uh, good morning. I wasn't expecting this, but all right. So good morning. My name is Paul Raven, as Bert noted. Uh, I've been with PASO since 2017. Um, up until... Uh, in the first few years, I, I, I mostly focused on FSDs. I've also served as PAFSO's negotiator for roughly maybe the last five or six years. Um, uh, I'm also a member of the uh, National Joint Council FSD Committee, which uh, is the committee responsible for hearing FSD-related grievances that aren't resolved within departments and also responsible for uh, renegotiating uh, the FSDs. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, my title at the moment is, is, is negotiator and, uh, and labor relations advisor. I'm kind of leaning more in the negotiations area a bit, a uh, bit more these days. Uh, we have a cyclical review process underway for the FSD. So that's occupying a lot of my time. Um, but yeah, still also, uh, providing, uh, both, uh, both members and, uh, and the PASO team, uh, my, uh, my, my advice on, on, on certain cases as well. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we, uh, and, and Paul will, uh, later on do a small presentation also with regards to FSDs. So if you have any, uh, questions or concerns regarding FSDs, uh, you know, he'll be able to share some of his, uh, expertise with you, um, we also have Jake Bizana, who basically joined PAFSO in September 2022. Uh, he is essentially the the the, the LRA that kind of you know replaced me when I became the general manager, uh, and his subject matter expertise falls uh, with uh, staffing complaints and mostly human rights case. Um, and we also have. I'm also fortunate to have Monique, you know, here with us. So I'll ask Monique to do the same thing as Paul did, which is basically introduced herself. Yep. Also wasn't expecting that, but that's okay. Um, so yes, I'm Monique. Um, so I joined PAFSO in July, 2023. Um, I do mainly work on FSD cases, um, but I do also work on general labor relations cases as well. 
um, in terms of my background, uh, several years of experience in mediation and negotiation in the private sector. And yeah, I don't know what else I can really say about myself. That's Thanks. good, Monique. That's good. Um, look, essentially, that's that's the LRA team. Now, although they each have their own area of expertise, it does not necessarily mean that if you have a particular issue, for example, uh, with regards to pay, that your case will automatically go, for example, to, to, to our subject matter expert, right? I mean, cases are assigned uh, to individual uh, LRAs based on, on you know, a, a multitude of, of factors that are being considered. But, you know, the, the interesting thing about this team is really the dynamic of, of the team. We work together really closely. We have meetings on a regular basis where we discuss cases and where we exchange ideas. And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we are good at what we do. Uh, and we are extremely uh, competent and qualified and are able to provide the best possible advice sometimes to our members. Um, now, the key role of, of PAFSO's uh, labor relation team is under my direction as general manager. Uh, the labor relation advisors uh, provides a wide range of service to our members. Uh, these services uh, include the fair representation of their rights, working conditions, entitlements, or and interests as outlined by the F or outlined within the FS collective agreement, uh, or the employers any of the employers policy, as well as other labor related and human rights legislation. Uh, as a representative and a, as an advocate of our members' rights, uh, the, LR, the, the labor relation advisors is there to provide technical and strategic advice, recommendation, guidance, support, and sometimes, and you will see later on, representation to members on a very a variety of workplace matters, uh, mainly in terms of filing grievances, appeals, complaints. Uh, they, they are active in the mediation process and adjudication uh, and or also some other uh, third party boards or administrative uh, tribunals. So these are essentially the key function, the key role of a labor relation advisor. That is, as you can see, a wide range of, of expertise and, and, and a variety of, of recourse processes that they are involved with. Um, some of the key functions of the LRAs, well, they do research, they do analyze and interpret legislations, regulations, legal pre precedent, so the case law, and they gather facts and evidence to provide sound advice or offer different options to our members in order to kind of prepare this the representation strategy or you know their the, the arguments or any recommendations that are put forward by by the LRA and they also obviously do the presentations uh, before the employer or a third party tribunals uh, to advocate on behalf of our of our members. They represent members at each step of the internal grievance process. Uh, they provide technical advice and support to members involved in workplace investigations. Uh, and there are many types of different investigations that can, uh, can be undertaken by the employer. Uh, they provide guidance to members on the preparation of their allegations and or their response to allegations. Uh, they attend proceedings, maintain re uh, written records, and provide advice on different available options to the member. They provide technical advice and support to members in uh, mediations and other forms of uh, dispute resolution. 
they review the employer uh, proposed policy and or program and provide analysis or recommendation, or they, they prepare responses uh, to these policies when there's a need to provide a response. Um, and they represent an advocate for the interest of PAFSO at the employer union or you know union management consultation forum uh, or departmental labor management multi bargaining agent and other stakeholders forum. So there's many meetings where the employer consults with the union and their job is to essentially represent or advocate on behalf of our members. Now, uh, sorry, Mark, can I also jump in and just, I just wanted to add another another thing that is very valuable to, to me and to XCOM in particular, which is that you guys provide us with technical advice on what's going on, on our advocacy, what's possible. Um, you know, for example, now we're looking at what we can do about the MSH thing. And uh, I've asked Bert to investigate, to talk to our lawyers and to talk to other bargaining agents and see what um, what is reasonable and feasible. Because again, you know, coming back to that, uh, that, that labor relations concrete knowledge, sometimes we don't have that. Right. And so we we rely on you guys really to support us and make sure that we're not sending the organization up a wrong tree somewhere that's not gonna that's not gonna go anywhere. Thank you for clarifying that, Pam. I forgot about that one also, right? Thank you. Um now in, in terms of the 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 needy greedy kind of part of the presentation that I think is important for you to kind of understand here, right? is to kind of get a sense of what happens when you reach out to PAFSO and you want the service of one of our labor relation advisor, or at least you want a better understanding here of your rights uh, in, in specifically to a situation, right? Now, one of the, the key element, the key role of the, a labor relation officer is whenever they get a question or an issue from, from our members, well, they their main role is to do a complete assessment on the merit of the case in order to determine uh, what is the best possible option to try and, and, and get some resolution in, into the matter, right? And whenever a member reaches out to us, it is absolutely crucial that him or her or, or it uh, provides as much information as possible so we can do it and so that the labor relation officer can do an accurate analysis of the case and, and make a, an appropriate assessment, right? Now, you, it's important to understand that when a, a labor relation advisor gets uh, uh, you know, a call or gets uh, an email from a member, right? Well, the, the labor relation advisor can only consider the facts and the circumstances that are provided to them uh, by the member. Uh, now, obviously, the LRA, because of their, their, you know, expertise, can certainly go back and ask for further clarification, right? But what's important here is to kind of understand that, uh, you know, we have to kind of base our assessment uh, in regards to the information that we receive from a member. And sometimes the information might be crucial. And if it's missing, it can change uh, the entire pers perspective of, of, of the case. So, um, you know, my suggestion or my recommendation is whenever one of you have an issue or would like for us to kind of look at a situation, well, it, you know, that that you provide as, as much information as, as possible, right? Um, one other element that is important to understand um, is that the way, the way we work at PAFSO uh, it's always better to reach out to us using our info at PAFSO email address uh, because once a case comes in, 
it is my role to kind of assign the case to a, a an available labor relation advisor. I know some of you may had may had dealings with a particular labor relation advisor in a you know in a case in a previous case or you are potentially involved in a current matter and you're dealing with uh, one specific labor relation advisor. Um, I always recommend that. If you have a new element or a new case that you want to kind of get our input on, it's always best to kind of go through our, our general email at info at PAFSO, uh, because there's a there's a chance that despite the fact that there's already a, a labor relation advisor assigned to a case, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the same labor relation advisor or the new case, okay? And as I said, make sure that you provide sufficient details so we can determine most, you know, essentially what the nature of the case is and really understand what are the, the issues here. Now, in terms of a, you know, a, a matter involving the interpretation of our collective agreement, and that includes the FSDs, uh, the labor relation officer will not provide general interpretation. I know some members approaches us and say, uh, am I entitled to get such and such benefit, for example, right? Well, it's not our job to kind of provide, you know, general interpretation answer to some broad issues. Uh, our primary focus is, is to kind of look at the response that the member got from management or the decision that they've received from management and see whether or not this was applied properly by management and if a, a potential recourse uh, is is available uh, for for our members. okay So that is essentially our role. Bert, can I uh, just can yes? I just jump in on, on this this point because I think you know it's important that people understand why we're always saying you know you have to go to management and and get an answer before we can you know kind of give advice I mean the reason you outlined definitely but also let's face it like management they're the ones with the resources they're the ones with big budgets and big teams and it's their responsibility to know these provisions to interpret them and to give you proper advice and I feel quite often that there are moments where the, the, the employer would really love for us and for other unions to take over responsibility for advising members on certain things. And we are just not, um, we're just not prepared to do that. I mean, we're not, we're not resourced appropriately. Um, and also, you know, it is, it is not, uh, it's it's not our responsibility. And we, you know, part of part of the policies are to hold the employer to account on the services and that they're supposed to be providing to employees. So that's a policy from the from the policy political level. That's uh, you know that's why I I like these provisions as well. Paul, oh, you want to jump in here? I just wanted to yeah add to 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 Pam's comment there that just specifically with FSDs, HEA normally employs low twenties uh fsd advisors so let's say 20 to 25 fsd advisors and a big part of their job is providing answers in relation to you know what does a particular provision in the fsd mean does a particular employee qualify for a particular entitlement provided by the fsds so obviously paso doesn't have the scope to take over the work of you know 20 to 25 individuals within within hea now if you get an answer from them that you're not happy with uh, then it would be time to uh, to reach out to us. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to to make that point. And, and, and just to chime in on both Pam and Paul's comment here, uh, I mean, I, I certainly understand and I get it that uh, some of our members, when whenever they reach out to their FSD advisor, it may take a, a, a lengthy period to get an answer. And I we get that for sure. And, and we understand the frustration around that. But it's it's not our role to essentially do the FSD advisor's job, right? So it's important for for all of you to at least get a decision or an answer uh, 
uh, to your entitlements uh, before you you reach out to us. So I think that's Monique. You want to chime in? Go ahead. Um. Oh, not necessarily. A little off topic, but not really. I just wanted to circle back to um, some of the things that are written. We are requesting that members, you know, write in to us. But I just wanted to acknowledge, you know, uh, that some members may feel hesitant to reach out regarding sensitive circumstances, especially in writing. Um, so I kind of wanted to address that. Um, in these cases, we still do encourage members to reach out uh, to our general inbox to give as much information as they're comfortable with. Um, but I did still want to say, you know, that we still do take phone calls. <laughs> The members are still able to reach out to us, discuss the details of their case over the phone as a starting point. Um, we're still willing to work with members and their very comfortability. Um, and we can still provide guidance and advice over the phone. Um, because I we still handle situations, um, you know, for example, um, you know, harassment, workplace violence, um, things like that, you know, we can still discuss. Um, you know, people if they don't want to put that in writing to start. We can still talk about it. Um, I just wanted to bring that up just because in the slide, we don't have that um, addressed. And, you know, we have a very written process and eventually it will have to go in writing. But, you know, we can still provide guidance and things like that over the phone as a starting point. Thank you, Monique, for that clarification. Yes. Uh, next slide, Pam. Oh, <laughs> sorry, falling down in the jaw. No, no, no. Donc, il y, a, il y a différents types de recours euh, qui sont disponibles pour nos membres. Euh, en fait, euh, il y en a une multitude euh, de recours et d'options possibles, euh, mais dans le cas de nos, nos agents de relations de travail actuellement, on peut dire qu'il y a environ à peu près une douzaine de recours qui sont utilisés sur une base euh, régulière par notre équipe d'agents de, de relations de travail. Les recours qui sont disponibles ou les options qui sont disponibles pour nos membres euh, dépendent particulièrement des faits et des circonstances de chaque cas individuel. Ça dépend également de la nature du dossier et ça dépend également des mesures correctives euh, demandées par le membre. Euh, euh, I just got a pop-up, sorry. Euh, donc, essentiellement, lorsque les agents de relations de travail reçoivent une situation de la part des, des, des membres, la première chose qu'ils doivent faire, c'est d'établir la nature du dossier, la nature du cas. Euh, parce que chaque cas a un recours spécifique et chaque recours a ses propres procédures, ses propres délais et ses propres limitations. Donc, Lorsqu'un agent de, de relation de travail reçoit un dossier, au, autant que possible, ils vont mettre l'accent sur l'utilisation de recours pour lesquels euh, nous pouvons jouer un rôle euh, de représentant versus un rôle euh, d'accompagnateur. De, 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 Et les rôles sont assez importants à distinguer dépendamment de la nature, évidemment, du dossier qui nous est présenté. Je vais vous donner un exemple concret. Par exemple, dans un cas de, de, de droit de la personne, donc une situation, par exemple, euh, euh, qui est liée à une accommodation. Euh, évidemment qu'il y a différents recours possibles lorsqu'une personne euh, traverse une période difficile euh, par rapport à sa, à sa situation d'accommodation. Et autant que possible, les agents de relations de travail vont regarder vers le grief euh, plutôt que vers une, une plainte euh, parce que le grief nous permet d'agir en tant que représentant. So what I'll do now is I'll switch to Monique. Monique will kind of explain to you the difference between when an LRA plays a representative role versus an advisory kind of role here. So Monique, off you go. Yeah, so can I could I just jump in with it? I just got a question from somebody saying, would there ever be a situation where someone would where the where PAFSA would go forward with a complaint or um you know a, a grievance without the without the consent of the member? Um and 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 that's that's an important question. We're, we're gonna get to that question specifically, but look. 
a, a member a member can go on on his or her own with the grievance that's that's within the legislation which by the way um the the federal public service is the the only environment where a grievance belongs to uh an employee uh, in in the private sector for example a grievance belongs to the union it's not the case in the federal public service it belongs to the employee so therefore just as as an example, right, PAFSO doesn't own the grievance, right? Uh, so, you know, if if a decision later on is taken to withdraw from the, the, the grievance process, that would have to come from the member and not PAFSO. Now, we don't own, um, you know, the grievance. It's called carriage rights uh, in, in the legislative context, right? We don't own the grievance except in one circumstance in, or, or one type of grievance. And this is grievance pertaining to the application or interpretation of the collective agreement. So in, in the cases that we're basically applying the collective agreement, then the member would need consent of PAFSO to move forward with their grievance uh, okay. without... Without the consent, the member cannot, you know, bring the matter on their own uh, to adjudication, for example. Okay. So I think though they're asking the opposite. Like yeah. the, uh, that's definitely good to know. But like um, they're saying, you know, if at some point they get they decide they want to stop the grievance, get out of the process, oh, I don't want to take this forward. Would there ever be a circumstance where Papsa would say, no, nope, we're going? Uh, it, and and I know Paul Paul has his hand up. I'm sure he wants to. I'll let Paul. I'll let Paul handle this one. There you go. So Paul, go ahead. So, the short answer is no. If an employee wants to stop the process, or if a member wants to stop the process, then the process is done. When we're talking about grievances that are generated by circumstances that pertain to a particular employee or member. Uh, there is, however, a type of grievance that doesn't necessarily involve uh, specific members getting involved. That's called a policy grievance. Um, so this is when, uh, you know, PAFSO or, an, or another union perceives an employer policy as, as, as going against what was negotiated either uh, within the collective agreement or the FSDs or any of the other NJC uh, uh, policies or directives. So we can move forward as a union with a policy grievance without necessarily involving individual employees or members. But when we're talking about uh, you know, a case that, that pertains to the circumstances of an individual employee or member, then yeah, if they say stop, we stop and it's, and it's done. Okay, thanks, and I think that, that is. And I will add, Pam, that technically speaking, we would have the right as a, as a union to to pursue a, a collective agreement matter without, you know, the employee's participation. Or, but I say technically because in practice, we, we would not would, we would not do that because you know we would have to rely on on the member right uh, on the employee to kind of bring our case forward. So. Um, you know, I, I don't see it any make situation sense. yeah where where we would continue on without the, the members' consent, right? Or the members' approval. Right. Okay, Thanks. thank okay. you. So Monique, do us the honor of, of presenting the next slide, please. Sure. So uh representative and advisory capacity. So LRAs can act in both representative and advisory capacity. Uh, depending on the circumstance. As a representative, the assigned LRA will take a more active role in the member's case. Uh, for example, we file grievances on behalf of our members and represent their interests in all hearing levels, uh, whereas in an advisor capacity, the member will represent their own interests, and the LRA will provide uh, guidance and advice only observing should our presence be requested. Uh, here we can see how various subject matters fall within these different brackets. Um, as a representative, uh, here you can see that our representation is typically provided during various grievance processes. Outside of this, we represent members in staffing complaints and workers' compensation appeals as well. 
as you can see. Um, then the advisor capacity, here are various examples of processes where LRAs act in an advisor capacity. So we have harassment, violence in the workplace complaints, Phoenix pay matters, uh, reintegration into the workplace, investigation on appointments, administrative investigations such as disciplinary meetings or public servant, um, public servants disclosure protection act, and matters related to the public service health care <laughs> plan and uh, Canada Life or MSH. And that's now, all of it. Now I I do understand that MSH is currently a hot a hot topic. Uh, we kind of are hearing some horror story about MSH debacle right now. Uh, we can, you know, we can later on discuss it, or if you have any specific question on it, we can try to answer some of your questions. Um, but just to kind of give you a perspective of what Monique is saying here, you know, in terms of, of MSH particularly, we don't do a representation role. We don't have a representation role. We play more uh, an advisory role uh, to try try to help and guide our members uh, around some some issues. Obviously, though, we may play an advocacy role, and that's completely different. And this is out of the scope of labor relations advisor. That belongs to to Pam and and her team. That they mostly do advocacy uh, on on more the the political front, but in in terms of you know, an employment related matter. Uh, this is outside, unfortunately, kind of outside the scope of our of our ability to to represent our members to say to say it politically speaking, right? Pam, do you want to jump in here? Because oh, I no, no, I just wanted. I was just going to make the point that there's this other thing, this this advocacy piece, and that the MSH issue is actually one of those issues where. I have the feeling that sometimes that the, the employer side would love for PASO to do their job. You know, I've, I've heard comments to the effect of, oh, it must be a lot for you to be keeping track of all of these complaints and, you know, all these issues and sending them to the company. And it's like, we're not sending them to the company. We do not have a direct role with the company. We are not the contract holder. The contract holder is the employer. The employer is responsible for providing employees with health care. Uh, at home in Canada and abroad. And it like when we put pressure, the the company to me is 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 almost irrelevant. Like it doesn't matter which company it is. It's up to the employer to figure out how to deliver that to you guys. And so that's where our intervention is. And we are not going to take on any kind of direct uh, link there because that is just not our job and we're not resourced to do that. Um, so, you know, and we don't have a mandate to do that. So that's one of those, one of those things, but there is this other possibility for, you know, broader, for action on broader things that don't fall under the thing that comes under that either, either one of the technical, um, elements and that's the, the advocacy function for PASO. So Perfect. next slide, please, Pam. Um, just to come back and highlight uh, some of the results we've we've received from our, our latest survey on discrimination and harassment, uh, you know, the, the, the next slide is to kind of highlight the difference in terms of representation uh, between a discrimination case, for example, versus uh, an harassment case. Uh, these are two different separate processes. And the role of the labor relation advisors when it comes to these two types of, of case uh, are essentially quite different. Um, in terms of the discrimination, right, uh, this falls under a the collective agreement, specifically under Article 43 of our collective agreement. Um, the labor relation officer in these cases, they do act as representative, so therefore they speak on behalf of the member. Uh, there's a, there's, you know, the, the recourse, the appropriate recourse is that we first go through the internal grievance process, uh, which in best case scenario would last between three to four months, uh, depending on obviously uh, the organization. For example, uh, those who are working at GAC, 
the, the internal grievance process is currently a two-step process. Uh, whereas if you work at IRCC, uh, well, it, the internal process is a, a three-step process. So there's, there's some differences here uh, between the two organizations. Now, the, the, most, the most important aspect is that because the grievance pertains to the collective agreement, the grievance can ultimately be referred to adjudication. And essentially, we can ensure that there's going to be a decision from an impartial third party, right? And, you know, more importantly also is that the type of remedy that is available to our members, while well, it can it can lead up to uh, an award or damages that goes to up to forty thousand dollars in in terms of of damages. So obviously, when we follow, for example, a recourse pertaining to the collective agreement, uh, and you know, we we kind of have some control over the process. We do have some authority, or or we can control more the outcome of a grievance, right? Whereas, for example, on the other side, on the harassment front, well, the recourse falls within a directive, uh, uh, an employer directive, which is the directive on the prevention and resolution of workplace harassment and violence. So essentially, the employer controls the process because it falls under one of their directive. Uh, in these cases, the labor relation advisor only act in an advisory capacity. Uh, now, the recourse itself, I mean, you know, there are internal investigations uh, available. You can ask either Paul or Monique, they will tell you these investigations tends to last for years sometimes uh, in order to get a, a conclusion. Right, there is no possible review from independent uh, body, and essentially the most important aspect is that the remedy part, the corrective action part, is at the discretion of the deputy head. Um, so, you know, there there is definitely some differences in terms of our role and in terms of the ability uh, to 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 advocate and to get some results uh, depending on, as I said, the nature of the case and, and the, the available recourse. Pam, do you have a question? I do. I, I just got a question on email. Someone is asking about the relatively new legislation on under occupational health and safety on yes. psychological hazards in the workplace, um, which presumably could include harassment and discrimination, I'm sure and how that would affect PAFSO's role operating it, that. Yeah, it, it, yes, there, there is, uh, since uh, January 2023, January 1st, 2023, uh, occupational health and safety is now covered under the, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, uh, which basically provides uh, some uh, potential uh, some potential representation or more representation role in the sense that if the employer is failing to meet their obligation under the act, we can certainly take the case on and, and bring it to the attention of uh, the agency that is responsible for OSH issues. So in other words, if they fail to kind of take the matter seriously and do proper investigations, in terms of OSH, right? Uh, we can certainly bring, you know, the agency, it's uh, employment, used to call employment and anyway, don't quote me on this, I forgot the, the, the department's name, but they can certainly step in and investigate. They have the authority to investigate a matter and force the employer to take the appropriate action if need be, for sure, right? So that's a new, a new kind of element, uh, particularly on on OSH issues. Okay. Have we seen Have we seen that tested in mm. in the departments where our with our our members? Not yet. And correct me, Paul or Monique, if I'm uh, 
wrong here. Uh, I don't think we had the opportunity yet to get uh, an outside investigation done. Uh, I, I do understand that people now are kind of forced to file in a notice, what they call a notice of occurrence, which is kind of a complaint that they file uh, directly to management. And Paul, I'll let you, I'll let you, uh, you know, come in here because that's your area, right? Not more. Well, I, I think an important distinction to make here is that this new recourse option is not, it's not intended to replace the uh, harassment complaint process that's in place within the departments. It's yeah. basically intended to serve as as oversight to ensure that those uh, investigation processes exist, are carried out in a in a reasonable manner uh, and, and, are, and, are, and are fair. So basically in order to bring that that new legislation in play and that new complaint process into play, basically GAC or IRCC would have to ignore a harassment complaint and not carry out an investigation or be very uh, um, proactive, be very, ar very, very arbitrary in the way that they do so. And uh, we haven't seen that happen as of yet. Okay. Thanks. I will. I will stand there. Do you want your next slide? Yes. Next. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, I don't want to become too technical, but obviously in, in carry out their responsibilities, uh, you know, the, the legislation tells us that the Federal Public Service Labor Relation Act tells us that labor relation advisors have to carry out their duties in a, in a fair uh, representation manner, right? So under Section 187 of the Federal Public Service Labor Relation Act, Unions must represent members or employees fairly in relation to their right under the collective agreement. Uh, this means that the union cannot treat uh, the employees or its, its members uh, in a way that is considered to be arbitrary, discriminatory, or in bad faith. Uh, when they are advancing their complaints or their grievance against the employer. However, within, within the legal parameters of Section 187, uh, the bargaining agent has the discretion to determine the scope of representation. Um, so that means essentially that it's not because we have a duty of fair representation obligation here that we will put forward every case that we will be advancing all situations and one, I think one of the distinction between PAFSO and some other bargaining agents is that we carry out our duty quite diligently. Uh, we assess cases uh, very thoroughly, right? And we are really upfront and honest with our members uh, upon, our, upon our assessment whether or not we will be taking the matter forward. Uh, this is this is within our authority. Uh, and we've PAFSO has has developed uh, some protocols on representation, which essentially describes the role and also describes the manner in which, you know, we will not take on cases when that happens. It doesn't happen frequently, but it does happen. Uh, so it kind of describes, you know, the process that we follow if we get to the point where we can no longer advance uh, a grievance or a complaint that was filed by our members. So obviously those who are interested in all this, if you want a copy of our protocols on representation, they are available on our website. I would certainly recommend that you consult them if, uh, you know, at one point you file either a grievance or a complaint with us because that becomes important. And I, I do think it's important for us as an organization not to bring forward cases that we know will not be successful at the end. Um, I'll stop at that. Pam, next slide. 
So just to kind of go over again in, in broad general terms, our services when it comes to uh, you know the the labor relations advisors authority. When members communicate with us for services, their individual matter will be assigned to one of our LRAs, as I mentioned, based on the nature of the case and the LRA's availability. Now, the labor relation advisor, who after reviewing the facts, the case law, you know, the collective agreement, and also take into consideration the collective interest of our membership as a whole, and also uh, the potential financial constraint, uh, he or she, the LRA, will decide whether or not we will going to offer representation. And I can tell you, having done the work for almost 35 years, I can assure you that if, if we reached the conclusion that we're not going to offer representation, it's because there is no chance of, of any success. Uh, I know the team, uh, it takes a lot of pride and, and, and you know, enthusiasm in, in, you know, representing our members to the best of their abilities. Sometimes we just have cases where, unfortunately, we cannot move forward on. Um, in some cases, uh, the LRA may determine that it's not in the best interest of our membership or the membership in, no, sorry. It's not in the best interest of the, either the member or the membership in general uh, to proceed with the manner, right? Uh, now, the when whenever a decision, a decision is reached not to move forward with the case, the LRA will always inform the member of, you know, the the rationale behind the decision in writing, okay? This is what we do, so there's no kind of, you know, hopefully no misunderstanding here. But the LRA in those cases will also offer to the member, if and when it's applicable, the option of self-representation, right? or if the member wants to seek representation from another party. Uh, as I said in the past, uh, if PAFSO decides not to offer representation or withdraw its representation during the course of a grievance process, a member will be able to pursue with his or her, her own grievances, except in situation that pertains to the application or the interpretation of the collective agreement. So that is also true, for example, in a staffing complaint, right? You do not need the service of PAFSO in order to put forward a staffing complaint, right? So members, in case of, for example, they're not satisfied with the outcome of a, of a competition, they can file their own complaint and even go at adjudication before the, the Public Service Labor Relation and Employment Board to argue their case on their own. Um, but I I will stress out again that if, uh, if, if one of our labor relation advisor, after assessing a case, determines that we simply cannot move forward with the case, it's because the likelihood of, of of having any success is is slim to none. Yes, Paul. Just just wanted to to flag that the the carriage rights there. So our ability, the, the requirement that we support agreements not only applies to the the collective agreement itself, but also the FSDs and the other NJC directives because they're while they have their own grievance process, they're included via by a reference uh, to with within the uh, the collective agreement. Well, I think Paul, that's a nice transition. If you want to talk uh, to to our our members about the 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 FSD process in particular, you have the floor here, Paul. Okay, um, Pam, maybe we can um, we we can stop the screen share there because I guess the the PowerPoint presentation is 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 finished there. Um, so. 
Yeah, I just wanted to provide, uh, take the opportunity to provide a brief update on uh, FSD cyclical. Um, so the FSDs are renegotiated roughly every five or six years uh, via a process called cyclical review. There are some similarities to bargaining, but also some, uh, some differences, um, big ones being that it's not us versus uh, Treasury Board for FSDs. Uh, we're technically representing all federal public sector uh, uh, bargaining agents and at the table with us are PSAC and PIPs. Uh, and on the employer side, uh, representing all departments, our Treasury Board, uh, Global Affairs, uh, IRCC, uh, and DND. Um, so that's a bit different, but also the way the, pro the process is set up is, 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 is different as well. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a long process and we anticipate a, a long road ahead uh, this particular round, but just with that kind of preamble in place, I'll, I'll bring you up to speed as far as where we're at now. Uh, so proposals were filed last summer uh, in July and August. Um, the fall and the winter was basically dedicated uh, to wading through um, what I'll call prelim preliminary, pre preliminary steps uh, in the in the cyclical review process. Um, and so we made it through those steps and we actually started at the table this week. So uh, uh, on Monday, we had our, our first roughly three hours at, at the table and uh, we'll be continuing uh, uh, for the foreseeable future, we're, we're scheduling two days a week to try and move forward. Um, to give you an idea of the scope of the uh, of the uh, of, of what we're looking at working at here, uh, we presently at the table have roughly 220 proposals, and the employer has 90 something. I don't remember the specific number, but. I think the low 90s. So all this to say, we have over 300 proposals between uh, between, between what with the bargaining agents file. And when I say bargaining agents, I do mean plural. Um, many, mo probably most of the proposals, not probably, definitely most of the proposals came from from us from Paso. Uh, but there there were other bargaining agents that filed proposals as well. Um, and so we, we, we've, we've, you know, that, that this is going to take time to, uh, to negotiate what happens. Oh, Paul, you're frozen. Or is Paul frozen for everybody else? Uh oh. Paul is frozen. <laughs> Paul is frozen. Um, well, maybe I could just jump in to say I'm really happy. Happens uh with each of those over. Sorry, we lost you, Paul. You froze there for a minute, and I think you're frozen again. Do you want to take your camera off, maybe? If it might uh, might help with bandwidth. I don't know if he can hear you. No, perhaps not. Um. So, well, maybe I'll just. I'm very happy with the fact that we've that we've gotten uh, agreement on you know the the agenda basically of what will be okay. Hopefully, Paul will come back. Uh, what will be discussed because we do have a number of proposals in there that have cross cutting implications that will move the needle on the FSDs. Sorry, Paul, we lost you there for for a, a minute. Geez, uh, Rogers is doing work in my neighborhood and I guess my internet got cut off. So I'm actually going through my, my phone at the moment. So hopefully this, uh, this works out. Okay. So how far did I get before? I think I probably talked for another minute or two before I realized that, uh, Talk for, a couple minutes for sure. And what was the last thing, um, uh, you, you were talking about sitting down at the table. It's going to take yeah, mo more. moving forward. That was your kind of last uh, comment okay. before, before so, you kind of broke. Oh, so we, we, we've, we've got over 300 proposals to wade through here, uh, a little over two thirds of which are belong to bargaining agents. Uh, we do hope that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to see some, some serious uh, gains for, for our members and, and all, you know, federal public sector employees this round. Uh, obviously, filing a proposal doesn't equate to there automatically being a a positive change stemming from that proposal having been filed. 
but there's a lot a lot of potential here. We've got uh, proposals covering a variety of issues, obviously over 200. Oh no. Oh no, there it goes again. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, but uh, yes, I think what he was gonna say was we've got a lot of proposals covering a lot of major issues. And we're looking at, you know, we do have to draft um, individual proposals. Sorry, Paul, go ahead. We've got a lot of proposals over, and you stopped at over 200. <laughs> okay, so over 200 are ours, uh, but I was just, what, I guess I can do, do a little overview and so, some of the, the key ideas we're trying to address this round, but um, I just, before I get into that, in case I freeze again, <laughs> um, we're, we're probably looking at a couple years here, like this does, take time. The last round we required hundreds of hours at the table to get to the the package that was 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 published as the new version of the FSDs in, on April 1st, 2019. Uh, I expect the same this round. The good the good news is that I think the parties at the table are pretty uh pretty competent and we I'm hoping we can just uh hammer through this in in the, as uh, efficiently a way as possible. I should mention that that Logan from IRCC, Logan McNamara is from PASO's executive also is, is at the table with me on behalf of PASO. So we actually have two people at that table. All right, I, I, I'm panicking a bit now in case my, my internet cuts out again. So I, I, I will try and uh, summarize like some of the key areas of our proposal. So uh, we've, we've requested service standards be put in place for HEA so that you know there's set amounts of time that they have to, to respond to uh, uh, requests or, or questions. Uh, there are technically service standards published by HED now, but they're not kind of legally binding for anyone to follow. So we'd like to see that, uh, that changed. Uh, we'd like to see recourse put in place for um, uh, if, if, if HEA or anyone else representing the employer provides inaccurate information or bad advice to employees, that's problematic. Uh, we've got a bunch of proposals uh, on the table in relation to relocating to or from uh, telework uh, locations or, or locations that aren't the place of duty. Uh, we've got a number of proposals in relation to pets this round, hoping to... Uh, facilitate relocation of pets and have some other provisions in, in place for pets. Uh, a big focus for this round uh, also is uh, uh, employees and dependents with disabilities and really trying to uh, 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 both clarify but also expand what's provided to, uh, to members and their dependents with, uh, with, with, dis with disabilities. That, that's kind of a uh, a, a quick summary of some of the, the, the key issues there, or we're also looking at, at resolving the whole crown liability issue. So some of you may have heard uh, about this, this notion that they can't go back more than six years uh, uh, in terms of uh, overpayments. Um, we're trying to get that tied off as well. Um, so that's kind of a summary. Obviously that doesn't encapsulate, uh, you know, the, um, over 200 proposals, roughly 220 proposals that were filed by the bargaining agents. There's all kinds of other things too, but those are kind of some of the the uh, the the areas of, of of focus for us this round. And can I just add too? I think we're trying to address some of the um, you know the 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 gender biased language, the you know the the, the old fashioned language and approach um, that was in that was in the FSDs that didn't take into account you know, some of the new configurations of, of family and, and so on. Oh, that, that's a huge one. Yes. I, I, I forgot about that. Thank you, Pam. And <laughs> yes, also, I it, want to get that in there because I know that's important. And in particular, the, um, the whole notion of how one ap applies for common law partner status for their partner, uh, that's been a bit of a, a train wreck in my opinion. So w there, there will be a push to revamp that, uh, that system, um, recognizing you know that the the way partnerships are formed today is not the way they were formed in the seventies. So let's uh, let's no, uh, let's move past that. Yeah, and the way families look today is not is not yeah. the same. 
right? Yeah. So, and I think we, we're also uh, pushing, I think, for simplification where we can where we can get it. You know, um, like right now with all of the nitpicking, accounting, and everything for all these different things, it's you know, it's a waste of the employer side resources and of ours. I think so. There's a lot we're going to be able to get um, to get at with this, and just in terms of strategy, I mean, one of the reasons that it's taken us till now to get to the table just for people who who are following this is that frankly we were refusing to back down when the employer um tried to say that they refused to discuss some of our proposals because they were new um and we were prepared to go to to exercise the arbitration provision in the in the that's attached to the njc which would be the first time we've done that for fsds anyway um and we will do that again if it if it comes to it i mean i you know the strategy is that like we we need to make fundamental major shifts in how this is done it's not working for anybody and i mean the, the employer side GAC and the others we work with agree with us on this um and you know if in order like we were not going to go off starting a, a years-long negotiation without key elements of importance to us on the table that's just pointless. Like, why would you set out on a years long journey, uh, you know, in a direction that's not even going to get you where you want to go? So we're, I think, prepared to dig in on, on different things. And so just in terms of timelines, that may, you know, it may mean that things take a little bit longer, but it also might mean that, you know, hope we tend to mean that, you know, there's a better framework and a more practical system that comes out of it at the at the other end. So um, maybe, did, Monique, Bert, did you guys have comments, any, any more comments on Paul's stuff? Because if not, I, I have, there are a couple questions that have, that have come in. Um, no, I, well, it, look, I don't know if Monique has any comments, but I certainly am interested in hearing some of the, some of the questions, if there's any out there. Okay, because we did, we blocked out an hour and a half for this. I mean, I can stay a little bit longer if there are questions. I encourage people to use the um, the Q&A function. Um, or, you know, if you want to put up your hand, I can then talk. I can make you a panelist. And I'd like to, uh, at the end, I'll stop the recording for a couple of minutes, just in case there's anybody who has questions or comments that they don't want to make on as part of the recording. Um, so one of the questions was, what happens, um, what are the occasions where PAFSO might engage a lawyer? Like the, I know we work often with Raven and Associates, uh, when a lawyer might be representing somebody at a hearing or whatever, um, you know, who does the lawyer, who instructs the lawyer in those, in those circumstances? Is it PAFSO or is it the individual? I think is, is what, the, what the question is getting at. And what are the circumstances where that might come into play? Okay, uh, in terms of outside legal, uh, you know, advices or, or representation, that, that calls comes from me. So, you know, if, if PAFSO do have to hire the service of our legal counsel on a particular case, uh, we, that can be made available. Now, understand that, you know, that service will only, technically, only uh, be provided if a case goes to uh, adjudication, right? Because in the internal process, that's entirely the role of the labor relation officer. Uh, now, we do once in a while uh, go up to our legal counsel to get legal opinions on, on different matters, right? So if it, you know, if there's a particular situation where there's a need to kind of, uh, you know, ask for, for a legal opinion, we go to our legal counsel and that's, direct link between myself and, and our lawyers to kind of get some some advice or some some opinions. Uh, but in terms of representation itself, it's only at, at in front of, of administrative tribunals that a, a service of a lawyer could be offered, right? And and this is something that that does more frequently happen uh, over at PAPSO. Yes. And my understanding is that when that happens, basically the lawyer, although of course the lawyer is going to talk to the individual complainant, right? The yeah. lawyer is working for us as an organization 
and is effectively like supporting the labor relations advisor. So, you know, every so often I hear people say, well, my lawyer and I want my, I wanted my lawyer to do blah. And perhaps I said, no, it's not actually really your lawyer in those circumstances. No. You know, yeah. normally, normally that division doesn't mean a heck of a lot, but you know, from time to time, it, it, it can come, it can come up. And every so often I hear from people who say, well, I hired a lawyer and now I want PASO to pay the bill. Don't do that. You're going to be, uh, you're going to be out of pocket. That's not how it works. You know, talk to, talk to Bert and the, and the team, um, you know, before you, before you make any of those decisions, yes. uh, assuming that, that uh, that's going to be somehow somehow covered. And another question we had was, could you give us some concrete examples of times when, you know, high level examples, because we don't want to invade people's privacy, but, you know, times when we have not gone forward on a case, even though maybe there was an argument, like I can think of, I know of one myself where the person just did not have documentation. And even though, you know, it seemed unfair, we were like, well, there's only so much we can do if we don't, you know, if, if we can't produce the, the information, can you, can you give us a couple of others just so people could have an idea? Well, look, the, the, the broad general circumstance where, you know, normally we would not, you know, represent members are kind of, you know, identified in our, our protocols of representation. Now, you know, one of the difficult area within our membership is because of ro the rotationality of, of employment, uh, sometimes people are, are on assignment in, in as an FS. Sometimes they're waiting to be assigned in an FS position. And quite frankly, sometimes, I mean, although some, some people are actually doing FS work, they're probably not a member of, of PASO. They're probably not an FS, right? So there's different type of, of people that reaches out to us that are not in a situation where we could, you know, legally speaking, represent them. So, you know, if, if, if we're having a situation where, you know, someone calls us and, and they're not a, an FS, uh, well, we can't represent them. Uh, in terms of, you know, simply a, a merit, you know, aspect, right? Well, there, there are some cases where, unfortunately, we don't have the evidence, right, needed to kind of show that there was, for example, a, a violation of a right, right? So in, in those cases, I, I mean, although a member has an allegation, right, uh, sometimes we don't have the supporting evidence to argue that there was a breach here in, of the collective agreement. And also there's there's some interpretation dispute also that whether we like it or not, sometimes the employer comes back with a decision and they are right in their interpretation, right? And that's things that that happens, right? Now, although sometimes members may dispute the employer's interpretation, you know, whenever we assess and, and whenever we look at uh, an employer's decision, we may conclude that the employer was actually right uh, in their interpretation. Right? And that apply like even if we think that the, that the the way perhaps the way the collective agreement is written or the way an FSD is written is, yes. you know, there was some unintended consequence of that that we could address in negotiations or in advocacy. Um, you know, when it comes down to those things where technically, like, this is what it says, and this is what they're doing, we, we cannot take a grievance forward. And from a policy point of view, you know, um, XCOM is, is not involved, I'm not involved in individual grievances, but we are involved, I mean, we were involved in the, the, the protocol of representation, because that's a policy document that guides the organization. And one of the principles behind the decisions on that was, look, like we don't have unlimited resources here. So, you know, even if maybe there is, you know, in natural justice, a kernel of you might get the right person at the PSLRB, like we have to think about, you know, how much 
where our time and energy or resources are best placed. And sometimes it requires those decisions. And in those cases, I'm telling y'all, don't come to me and say, hey, I didn't like the decision that, that they made because I don't have a role in that. Bert and I will defer always to Bert and the, and the team. I mean, I may sometimes say, hey, I think there might be something I could do on the advocacy side. You know, maybe I could talk to someone and, you know, see if there might be move a way to make a, a, a solution or something like that. But like, I'm not going to substitute my judgment for the judgment of, I think there's in the LRA team, a combined like hundred years of, uh, of uh, labor relations, you know, experience and mediation experience and, and everything. No, like that's not, that's not how it goes. And, you know, for a long time, I mean, um, the policy, I think, at PAFSA was basically to kind of say yes, yes, yes to a lot of folks and then not really do very much about the case and just kind of hope that it would dissipate. And we've moved much more to a, an honest policy, I think. And so from time to time, people disagree. You know, people disagree and say, no, I see. I think that they're I think I, my interpret of, of, of the this document is that this is wrong and you should be taking my case. And it's like, well, you know, if it comes down to it, we're kind of going to err on the side of the people with the decades of, you know, ed education and, and experience on those on those kinds of things. Paul, go ahead. Just to kind of add to those points that have been made, another element that I think is important to consider is grievance processes can be long. Like if we're talking about going to the board for adjudication, it's not uncommon, like five to 10 years in that in that vein. And the more people who have filed grievances and are in that queue, the longer that wait becomes. So why is that relevant? Well, if you have, you know, a thousand people waiting to have their case heard by the board and, you know, 600 or a certain number is, you know, cases that have no chance of winning, uh, those cases that are in the queue that have no chance of winning, one of the effects of their being in the queue is it's making it's it's creating a longer wait period for those that 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 have have a chance of success. So um, yeah, that just another consideration is we want to try and ensure as smooth and as fast a process as possible uh, for members. And one way of doing that is uh, not adding to that queue. With, with with cases that that are that are uh, highly unlikely to to succeed. Thanks, Paul. Sorry, folks. I just uh, there's something going on in my driveway, so I'm just I'm listening, but I'm moving along. So, Bert, can I turn the the uh, the chair over to you? Yes, and and just another consideration, also just to add to Paul's uh, point here. I mean, unfortunately, uh, in some cases, you know we kind of take decisions not to move forward on a case because bad cases makes bad precedent, right? And and we certainly do not want to create, you know, bad precedent if uh, if we bring forward a case that, uh, you know, is, is not going to guarantee us a, a positive outcome. Because in the in the line of work that we do, we have to rely on the case law, right? Whenever we bring forward a matter, and if the case law is is goes in a particular direction, uh, as a result of of bad cases or or not meritorious cases moving forward, that also puts us in a very uh, difficult difficult position. So, I mean, the the last comment I would make is that. You know, this doesn't really happen often. It, it does, however, right happen that we have to tell a member that we're not, you know, continuing on with their case. If uh, a member has any issues or any concerns or wants to kind of raise, uh, you know, some some issues, there's also a protocol, which is protocol two, that they can they can look at, and and if they if they're not happy or they want to complain uh, against the labor relation officer, there is a mechanism available, internally speaking, if uh, people want to kind of 
have their case uh, reviewed by by me, by the director, by the general manager. So, but the buck stops with Bert. The buck <laughs> stops at me. Yes. yes. So maybe if, if does anyone have any other questions? I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll pause. I'll turn.